Hello everyone, um, and thank you for coming to my talk on the critically endangered same Morsi pigs. Um, so my name's Shani, and I've been a zookeeper for coming up to 10 years now. Um, I've been working at Bristol Zoo for the last five years, and I've been a senior keeper there on the large mammal team for that time. So I work with all the large mammals you'll see um, when you come to the zoo, um, and obviously including the same Morsi pigs. Um, the same Morsi pigs are critically endangered. Uh, they're only found on two tiny islands in the Philippines, Negros Island and Panay Island. Um, and because of that, they um, are classed as, as one of the world's rarest pigs. Um, they, until very recently, they hadn't even been studied or seen in the world, um, which is why um, this talk is so important and why these pigs are so important at, at the, um, the Philippines place that I went to. Um, and I think also anyone that's worked with this species knows um, what an amazing species they are to work with. Um, they're incredibly charismatic um, and they're definitely one of my favourite species to work with. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about the work that um, I've done at Bristol Zoo um, with the pigs. And then I'll go on to talking about the stuff that I did when I went to visit our Philippines project um, over on Negros Island. Uh, so let me just start by talking about this here. So this, these are the kind of things that we do at Bristol Zoo. Um, it's just all of the basic things that we would do here. And the reason I'm kind of going through what we do here is to kind of show you the difference between what we do um, and how it was in the Philippines when I got there, really. Um, so this is just all the basic stuff we do. Um, and as I said, we've worked, I've worked at Bristol Zoo for five years. And in that time, we've made quite a lot of improvements. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk you through is our diet. Um, so this is our current diet sheet, um, so just bear this in mind when I talk about the diets of the animals in the Philippines because it's a, a very different story over there. Our pigs over here are very much spoilt and um, you can see here they get lots of different things. So they get a variety of starchy, watery and leafy vegetables. Uh, we've got a list there on the side to kind of show you what are the kinds of things they eat. That's not an extensive list, it's just the kind of things that we have to offer them, um, but they do have a lot more than that as well, a lot more variety. Um, so they have a lot of that every day, um, as well as that they have mealworms every day um, and that's for extra protein that they might need. They also have lots of like kind of browsing materials, so grasses, or cuts of trees, leaves, that kind of thing. And we offer them that to them as much as we can. Um, so it tends to be about three or four times a week really, as, long as, every, as, as well as everything else that they eat. Um, you'll also see at the bottom there they are on a couple of supplements. Um, zoo gem flex our pigs are on um, because they are a little bit older, a little bit arthritic and it, um, it just acts as a lubricant around the joints. Um, when the pig paddocks get a bit muddy and a bit foggy they do tend to suffer a little bit so the zoo gem flex really helps with that. So we do take care of our piggies here. Um, so since I've been at the zoo we have made a few different adjustments to the diet. Uh, first one is the addition of sprats. So our pigs did have quite dry skin, scaly skin at certain points of time of the year. So the same multi pigs do shed their hair. Um, when this happens, they tend to do a lot of rubbing and that causes lots of dry skin. So and we tried a couple of things to counteract this. Um, we dug wallows um, and we just kind of hose them down so that the pigs were able to wallow in the mud. And um, that didn't make much of a difference. And um, in fact, they didn't really use the wallows that much anyway. And um, we then introduced linseed oil to their diet, which again, um, they did eat, but it just didn't make much of a difference. So then we introduced the sprat. Um, they're quite an oily fish, um, so that did really, really help with their skin, actually. Um, and they loved them, so that also helped. It was quite a nice addition to their diet. Um, but the problem with the addition of the sprats um, is that sprats actually stop the gut from absorbing vitamin E. Um, and we did have one of our piglets actually die from a vitamin E related deficiency. So the reason I'm saying this is because there's any zookeepers listening to this, I think, oh, we'll add sprats in. Um, please listen to the rest of it because it can be quite dangerous. Um, so the vitamin E related deficiency that the piglet died from was called mulberry heart disease. Um, and basically there are no symptoms of this. So you won't notice anything um, until death, sadly. So what we do now to counteract this um, is when the female pig is pregnant, we don't give her any sprats at all and we give her vitamin E supplements instead. And then when the piglets are old enough, as soon as they can eat solid food, they're also given vitamin E supplements and we continue that until they're about six months old. Um, and, then, and then they tend to be fine after that. We haven't lost another piglet since. Um, the final thing that we do with our diet is when our female is lactating, she tends to lose a lot of weight. 
Uh, we've tried increasing the diet and it doesn't really make much of a difference and it kind of makes all the other pigs a little bit chunky. And um, so that doesn't really work very well. So instead of doing that, we um, added browser breeder pellet to our diet. And that's just really high in fat and protein um, and also high in vitamin E. So it's got all the things that your female lactating pig will need. Um, and that tends to help her keep the weight on, um, which isn't really a problem at most times of the year, but just when she's lactating. That's a little bit about our diet and the changes we've made. Um, as well as our diet, the main thing that I've made changes to whilst I've been at the zoo is our pig training. So this is just a slide of some of the training that we do here. Uh, anyone that's worked with this species of pig will know how flighty they are. Um, if anything is different, if anything smells different, if anything looks different, they are off and at the other side of the paddock before we even know anything's going on. Um, so they are very, very flighty. So training the species can be quite tricky. Um, but unfortunately for us, we have to vaccinate our pigs for um, something called erycephalus every six months. And erycephalus is just a bacteria and it lives in the tonsils of, can live in the tonsils of healthy piglets. And it's just transferred into water when they're drinking. And then other pigs get it obviously by drinking that contaminated water. But it can also exist in the soil for several years. Um, so our pigs have never really had it, but we do think that that paddock that they live in has it in the soil. So because of this, we have to um, vaccinate them every year because it can be a very um, dangerous bacteria. It's really difficult to treat. Um, and also it can cause death in pigs um, before you know what's going on. Um, so that's why we have to vaccinate every, um, every six months. So when we did our first round of vaccines, it was relatively easy. Um, as you can see in the picture here, um, this is Elvis having a bit of a scratch with his scratchy stick. Um, we kind of lured the pigs over with their favourite food items, which was at the time sweet potato. Gave them a bit of a scratch with a scratchy stick and then um, just jabbed them in the bum with a vaccine with a pole syringe. Um, so a pole syringe is just a long metal pole and you kind of load the vaccine into the end and then when you um, jab the pig the vaccine is discharged into the pig um, and it's relatively, well it's very quick, um, it's relatively stress-free because by the time they know something's happening it's kind of over. Uh, so that's how we did it the first time which was really quick and really nice. Um, it took a little bit of time for the pigs to come back to us and trust us again. Um, maybe a week or so, but after that they were fine. We managed to get them back up and running back into their training routine really quickly. So then the next six months came around um, and we tried to get the pole syringe out and the pigs ran a mile. So there was no chance of us getting them that way this time. Um, so sadly we had to dart the pigs, which can be okay. You know, it's not, it doesn't have to be a really stressful process, but it is just a bit more stressful than using a pole syringe. Um, sometimes the pigs might run around, so a little bit scared of the dart gun. Um, and that can cause starting injuries and it can cause um, the pigs to overheat because the pigs can't actually sweat. Uh, so it can be quite dangerous to the pigs and it's just not very nice. So um, the second time around that had to happen. Um, but then after that happened, I was like, this can't happen again. And we'll put a training program in place to kind of stop this from happening. Um, so I put this pulse range training in place so that they would willingly accept the pulse fringe so it wouldn't be a shock that they, this was happening to them and that they knew it was happening and it was their choice um, to be in that training session. Um, so there were a couple of things that we had to overcome for that to happen. Um, the first thing that we did is we trained them to touch their target to a nose, um, touch their nose to a target that way around um, and then we gave them a reward for doing that. They've just got a video to show you of that. So it's going to be a little bit awkward when I'm sharing videos because we've kind of realised that I have to close down my presentation to do it. But hopefully this one, will, the first one will work. So hopefully you can see this video now. Um, so this is one of our keepers, Imogen, um, just doing the basic target training with Polly. So she just puts the target stick through, Polly touches her nose to it, and then she gets a lovely sweet potato reward. And she's very good at it. I'll right, just have to go back in to show you my other screen again. So hopefully you can see that again. And um, so um, that's the first basic thing that we train for the pigs. It's quite a nice behaviour to train. Um, it gets the pigs to come over to you when you call them. It helps to build your relationship with the pigs. You've got a nice positive relationship with them. 
Um, and as I said before, it's relatively easy to do. Um, the tricky bit comes when you introduce a pulse syringe. So that was our next part that we had to do. Um, and we had a couple of things that we had to overcome with this. Um, the first thing was that when the vets come and use a pulse syringe, um, they tend to move it around a lot and it causes a lot of noise, a lot of the metal on metal sound, which the pigs really don't like. So we kind of had to desensitize them to that noise during the training session. And that didn't take very long, that was quite good. Um, so we got to the point where we did that and then we came to the next vaccination stage. Um, and as soon as the vet turned up, the pigs ran a mile again. Um, so we then thought, right, we need the vets to come down to every training session um, because otherwise these pigs are never going to be able to do this training. But obviously the vets are very, very busy and um, that couldn't happen. So we kind of thought we'll introduce them to a vet smells because the vets smell very vetty. And that's obviously they, they smell that and they run a mile before they even see the vet. So we tried a couple of things. We even tried the actual vaccine that we used. Um, it didn't really cause much of a response. And then we found we used surgical spirit. The pigs ran an absolute mile. So we spent the next couple of weeks using surgical spirit in their enclosure every day while um, doing lots of nice positive things with them, giving them lots of nice um, food. So they then be able to, so they then associated that smell with um, with getting nice things. Um, so from then on, we kind of we stop them being scared of the noise, we stop them being scared of the smell. Um, and from then on, it was quite straightforward, actually. Um, and this is what happens in the end process. So again, I'll stop sharing, I'll share the video. So this is a video of um, myself and Imogen again, um, target training aid of the pig. So Imogen is doing the basic target training that I just showed you before, and I'm doing a bit that the pulse syringe would be doing. Um, we didn't have a pulse syringe at the time, so that's why I'm using a stick, but it's the same process. So that would be loaded with a vaccine um, and that's all it would take, she'd be vaccinated. And she, you can see there, it's her choice to be there. Um, and on the day we'd use the actual vaccine and it would be a little bit scary, but it's not too bad. My screen again. There we go. Um, so yeah, that's the basic behaviour there, um, and I know it's not very complicated, but it probably did take us about a year, year and a half to get to that complete behaviour. Sometimes they're really easy, sometimes they're not. Um, so that pulse syringe training was the, the the main thing that I trained. So there's a picture of Elvis at the top there, um, under the training sign. You can see he's showing showing it for us nicely, perfectly. That he's being he's targeting with his nose, and he's being jabbed with the pulse syringe in the bum there. Um, another thing that we do with our pigs is we train them to go in the scales. So that bottom left picture is Elvis there showing us nicely that he's scale trained. Um, so we do that to weigh our pigs once a month. Um, and then if they're a little bit overweight or a little bit underweight, we can adjust the diet accordingly. Um, and that top right hand corner there, um, obviously a very high tech device we've got there. It's just a microchip scanner picked to a stick. Um, and that's just so that we can um, wave that around their head, so that we can pick up the microchip which is um, behind their left ear um, just in case we need to check who that animal is um, in case they're being exported. That's the kind of training that we do at the zoo. And um, the last thing we do is we give the animals enrichment every day which is a very basic thing we do in zoos over here. Um, so here's a couple of examples of things we do. We give them flowers, um, food and paper bags and boxes, that kind of thing, um, hanging feeders, and um, there's some grass in that box, um, in that hanging basket there in the top right hand corner. Um, barrels with things like peanuts in, which they obviously love. Uh, rotting logs, and that bottom right hand corner one is always my favourite picture of a pig having a lovely scratch. Um, so bearing all this in mind, I had high hopes um, for when I was going to the Philippines that I could introduce a lot of these things that we did at Bristol Zoo over there. Um, I thought I could buy them some scales, um, I could teach them how to weigh their pigs to monitor their weight, um, I could get their enclosures ready for pig releases if we were ever able to release these pigs into the wild. Um, and I could put training plans in place for that to happen. Um, I thought I could introduce enrichment plans for them to make sure the animals always had something to do. But there's a lot of things that I was thinking before I went out there that I wanted to do. Um, I had been told, obviously, it was a very um, underfunded place. Um, so I was to expect it not to be in the best of standards when I got there. Um, but I was just very aware that pretty much most of the world's captive population um, in an in-situ situation are at that captive breeding centre that I was going to. So if I, at the back of my mind, I was like, if I can improve this place and these animals are in a good condition, these animals could 
one day be released back into the world. And I know it's um it's a pipe dream and it's it will be a long way off, but um, that was always at the back of my mind when um when I was going over there. Um so um, bearing that in mind, I knew that I was gonna need a lot of money when I went over there because I knew it was gonna be underfunded. So the first thing I did before going over there was um get together with the mammals team at Bristol Zoo. Um, well, we kind of all did a brainstorming, we thought of a couple of good ideas, how we could raise money for me um, while I went out there. And the first thing we did is this conservation charity quiz. So um, I didn't do much of the organising, it was all down to the team, the mammals team, and they were amazing. Um, all I did was kind of coordinate it. But this charity quiz was mainly run by Zoe. Um, she organised the venue, she got all the raffle prizes, um, she kind of did all of that kind of side. There's a picture of Kerry there, um, she make, made us, uh, baked us a lovely cake as one of the raffle prizes. Um, and one of the other keepers, Olivia, she, um, she designed this poster for us and she did the actual quiz herself as well, so I didn't have to do it because I'm terrified of public speaking. Um, so the whole team helped out and it was really lovely. Um, my partner Mark also took loads of raffle ticket books into work and he sold like hundreds of raffle tickets at work. So kind of everyone chipped in, the team will sold loads of raffle tickets too. Um, and we managed to raise quite a fair bit of money from doing that. Um, the second thing we did as a conservation charity cycle. Um, so as zookeepers, we're very, very tired and we're all very broken as well. So for us to do this was quite a big deal. Um, so the idea, um, Ryan designed this place for us. And the idea was that we cycled the perimeter of Negros Island, which is the island um, where the same Wazzy pigs are found, but also the island that I was going to be staying at, where the captive breeding centre is. Um, and we cycled the coastline um, on the static bikes at our local gym. Um, so Scott came in, it was his birthday. Um, Jack did two hours at 6.30 in the morning and then he went off and travelled off to Manchester straight after that. And there were several people that kind of did a whole day at work and then came in on their lunch breaks just to help me um, and just to get that target really. Um, and there was a team of 14 of us and it took us about seven and a half hours. So it was quite a long slog, but actually it went quite quickly. Um, and we we're done by lunchtime. Um, so everyone did a really good job. Um, and we far, far exceeded what I kind of expected to, to raise. Um, I kind of thought we were gonna raise about a thousand pounds, but with the help of the rest of the team, we managed to raise um, 2,300 pounds, which was amazing. Um, and if I didn't have that money while I was out there, I definitely wouldn't have been able to do even a quarter of the things that I did out there. So it was, it was amazing to have that. So I can't thank everyone enough for that kind of support, really. Um, so now on to what I did when I went out there. So um, Bristol Zoo's Philippines project um, supports lots of different projects out in the Philippines, um, but it supports two captive breeding centres that are out there. Um, on Negros Island. There's the Talarac Foundation and the Centrop. So these are two very separate places. They're run by different people. Um, and it's not really the same as zoos over here. So zoos over here kind of collaborate. Um, they share resources, they share ideas. And um, they also, you're able to transfer animals between different places and it's quite easy. And that's just not the case over there. Um, if places don't, they, they don't have to communicate basically. So they tend to not. Um, so I went out to work at Centrop, and Centrop is a captive breeding centre run by Silliman University, and they're like a international university over there, and they're based in Dumaguete, um, which is a city in, in Negros Island. Uh, Centrop has a lot of different endemic species there, um, obviously including the Mosaic Morty pig, um, but also the Philippine spotted deer. So that's who that those are the two species that I worked most with when I was out there. Um, they're also the first captive breeding centre to hold the Negros bleeding heart dove and to actually successfully breed them. So that hasn't happened in captivity before. And they're the only place that's done it. So that's quite a, quite a big deal. Um, and all of that is actually down to the head keeper over there, Lou Jean. Um, he was fantastic when I was out there as well. Um, there are two different sites to Centro. Um, there's the Dumgeti site, which is a city site. And there's the Palimpinion site, which is the rural site. Um, I was based at the Dumaguete site um, and just because the Palimpinion site was, was a real pain to get to, it was quite far away. So when I arrived, um, I kind of realised I was going to have to lower my expectations of what I was able to achieve straight away. 
um, and I was just going to have to focus on a few key things and improve those few things and and that was going to have to be good enough really because there was a lot that needed to be improved over there and um, so the first thing that I focused on was the diet so again bear in mind all those lovely things that our pigs over here get to eat um, and when I got there um, a lot of the animals were under conditions they were a bit thin and um, their coats were a bit ropey looking and they weren't really in great condition um, and I had a look at what they were eating and the pigs and the deer were eating the same thing which surprised me because pigs are omnivores they eat kind of everything and the deer's a herbivore so they shouldn't really be eating anything um, like, high, high like the pigs do and um, so what they actually feed them is something they call mash so you can see that in the in these bottom pictures with the tires so that's what the pigs eating there and I looked into it and basically it's just um, flour, wheat and desiccated pig nut. So, so all that means is, is they're basically just being fed carbohydrates and the nutritional quality of that food is very, very low. Um, and it, it showed in the condition of the animal. So even, um, this is a picture of Ben Bol, the pig at the bottom there. He is um, quite a chunky pig because he does get a lot of food. Um, but his coat condition was poor and um, he still wasn't in great condition even though he was eating quite a lot of food. Um, so on day one, when I got there, I asked Lou Jean, the head keeper, to take me to where they kind of got their food from, um, just to see what else I could source, really. Um, and I was really excited because I found um, a commercial pig pellet there, um, which was supposed to be really good for the pigs, really palatable um, and really high in nutrients. It's a, it's a pig pellet for pigs from the meat industry, so it has all that kind of stuff in it, really. So it should be really good for them. Um, so I brought tons of it. Um, and Lu Jin was really quite surprised. I think I probably spent his whole two, three months wage pack just on, on this pellet. And I spent a significant amount, uh, amount of money on it, but I kind of thought that the animals need decent food to eat. So that's where I was happy to spend the money really. Um, so we introduced the pellet to their diet, 50% uh, pellet, 50% mash. So it was something they were used to eating and uh, mixed with something that they should find really tasty. I was really excited about it. Um, but I'll just show you what happened when I did introduce it. Hopefully this video is not going to be too jerky. It's a bit jerky when I played it earlier. Um, if you just focus on the pig that's sitting in the tire there. And this is the response that I got from all of the pigs that I gave the pellet to. And that was that it wasn't food. It was just something to play in. They just spent the whole time rolling around in it with their little legs up in the air like that, which was really entertaining, but it obviously wasn't the desired effect that I'd hoped for. But it did make me chuckle. Let me just get back into that screen. Hopefully it'll work a bit better this time. Okay. I think it's working this time, but... Um, so I basically had to scale back my expectations there as well. And I just spent the next four weeks gradually introducing the pellet into the pig's diet. Um, I soaked it just to make it kind of a bit more of the texture they were used to. Um, and I gradually increased the amount that they ate. Um, and by the end of the time that was there, I managed to get um, six of the seven groups eating the pellet, which was great. Um, it did take a long time though. Um, and after this mini triumph, I went to St. Trop's other site um, in Pelham Pignon. Um, and I was really surprised when I got there because all of the pigs there were fed on exactly the same thing and um, all the pigs and deer were fed on exactly the same thing as the pigs and deer at the other sites but they were just in much much better health and in much better condition and um, their coats were better shinier um, and were just um, in general much better nick than the ones that were at the other sites so I spoke to the keepers there and they said that they do feed them the same thing um, but that basically their diet is heavily supplemented with everything that they can find on site so they have coconuts, bananas, sweet potato, reeds, they have kind of everything that you need for a good pig diet there and they give them that all the time so that's why the pigs are in such better condition. Um, so I spoke to the university and they said that they have a vehicle that drives between the two sites twice a week delivering food um, and just checking on the animals there really to make sure everything's okay. So I set up a kind of resource sharing really so I got the keepers up in Limpignon to cut all the browse um, so the picture in the bottom, um, right on the bottom there with all the reeds in it, they, they cut those twice a week. They, there's also coconuts in that picture and they kind of get everything ready twice a week and then it's delivered by the lorry um, 
to the other site, which was really nice. And the animals absolutely loved it. Um, the pigs, the pigs in particular, really, really liked the reeds, and it was really nice. Um, you can see in the top there, there's a pig lying in a bed of reeds. Again, that wasn't the desired effect. He wasn't for sleeping on, um, but they did eat it as well, and that was really nice to see. So, um, I also set up, um, basically, because there's lots of land in the Pnimpani on site, I also planted lots of things. So I planted banana trees, coconut, sweet potato, anything that was leafy I planted that would grow there um, in the hope that in a couple of years' time, all of that will grow through. And um, also the site would be a bit more sustainable and they wouldn't have to spend money on food later on, um, especially with the growing population they have. That was really important for them. Um, after visiting Palimpignon, I went to Talarak Foundation, which was the other site that the other um, captive breeding centre that Bristol Zoo supports. Um, and it was really nice to go see them. So they're a quite a well-funded place. And it was nice to see how stuff can be done in the Philippines if you have the correct kind of funding. Um, but what I was surprised at was that they were also feeding the same mash mix. Um, so where I'd gone and spent a lot of money on an expensive pellet, they were doing the same thing. They were using the mash and then they were using lots of different vegetables and leafy things and um, offcuts off of trees to make their diet a well-balanced diet. Um, they were also using um, a vitamin powder for the pigs so that that kind of gave, gave them everything that they weren't getting and they were using salt licks for the deer which is something that I was already looking into getting anyway and it kind of confirmed to me that these they need these things in their diet and they didn't have them currently. Um, so I'll just show you a video of what happened when I introduced the salt lick to the deer. Um, so much the same as the pigs, um, anything that I tended to introduce to the deer uh, was a bit like lava. So there's a salt lick here behind, the, um, behind that tree that you can see and this deer is just approaching it very cautiously. And this is how they reacted to everything. Really, really wants it, but um, it's just too small. It's a bit much. Um, but eventually, they. Oh, let me try and screen share again. Um, so eventually they did get used to the salt licks and they do now love them. That's quite good. Um, so after I got back from visiting all these different places, I kind of sat down, had a look at Centrop's budget and realised actually there is, there's no way that they were ever going to be able to afford the expensive pellet that I brought. Um, so although it's there and they're still using it now, I kind of made a new budget, um, used their budget to make a new diet um, to include everything that the pigs and the deer needed but just didn't include the pellet really. So I did that by obviously sourcing stuff from both sites um, and I was able to make a good diet for them both without increasing their budget um, too much at all. Um, so that involved the pigs. It had sweet potato, banana, um, coconuts and reeds um, several times a week. Um, so they, they had something extra every single day. And um, for the deer, it meant they had browsing material every single day. Um, previous to this, they kind of had one of those things maybe once a week and it just wasn't enough. Um, I also obviously introduced the salt lick to the deer and the vitamin powder to the pigs, um, and it made a huge, huge difference. I'm trying to show you my next slide, but again, I don't know what to do. There we go. Um, so then after compiling the diet, I introduced diet sheets for keepers. So they'd never seen a diet sheet before, they'd never weighed food before, 
Um, so it was a bit of a tricky process. So what the keeper had been doing previously was just um, making up a big, a couple of big buckets of food, starting at one end um, and feeding the pigs going around and finishing at one end. So the pigs at the start kind of got less food than the pigs at the end because the ones at the end just got whatever was left over. And as a result, all the pigs at the end were quite chunky um, and they were kind of ranging from, um, if you look at this body condition score chart here, they're ranging from like five to eight and all the pigs at the beginning were ranging from one, two and three. Um, and I asked the keeper why he did this and he was just like, well, that's just what's left over. So that's what they get. Um, and the thinner animals, if they didn't eat very much, they were just fed less. And the fatter animals, if they ate more, they were fed more. So it wasn't really done judging by what the animals needed or um, how thin they were or how fat they were at all. Um, so I bought scales for both sites. I bought loads of buckets so that um, each individual enclosure had its own bucket. I taught them how to weigh out the food so that each enclosure had an allocated amount of food and that is how much that group got. Um, I also showed them, um, well I realised that although I had planned to go over there and, tell, and help them how to weigh animals, I realised that these animals were just way too shy and it just was never going to happen, it wasn't practical and also um, it was still my hope these animals might potentially be released back into the wild so I didn't really want to increase any kind of desensitisation at all to people. Um, so instead of that, I designed this body condition um, score chart for the same water pigs. Um, I tried to look for existing ones um, that maybe the stud book keepers or, or something like that used, but there wasn't one. So I managed to make this one using all the pigs that lived there. So there was such a wide variety of pigs. I, I was able to do that, apart from this last picture, obviously, body condition score number nine, that one is not at the collection. Um, so I taught the keepers how to use this. And I kind of told them if the pigs are a number three or below, they are to increase their feed by 50 grams per feed. So they were fed twice a day. And if their body condition score of five and above, they were to decrease the feed by 50 grams a day per feed. Um, so the diet sheet was they get mash AM and PM, and then they get all these extra things that I mentioned um, throughout the course of the day. So sweet potato, banana, and coconut, they'd get that as an extra scatter. So this was a huge improvement from before. Um, this previous time when I got there, they, they were just fed once a day at around three o'clock. So for the rest of the day, they wouldn't have any food at all. So they got a lot more food after I left. Um, and the result of this is some pigs that put on a lot of weight, which is really lovely. So this is one of my favourite pigs, Carla. Um, so in the top left there was what she looked like when I was there. Um, and basically they'd separated her from her group because she lost an awful lot of weight and they'd kind of separated her off so they could feed her up um, but they uh, hadn't increased the diet at all and she also um, wasn't eating very much because pigs are really social animals and they don't really do very well by themselves so she in the time I was there she was just continuing to lose weight and um, so I wormed her um, just in case she had any kind of parasites in there that was causing her to be this thin uh, I increased her diet as I did with all of them um, and then I introduced her to this handsome chap at the bottom, Antonio. Um, so he's the pig. He's the pig at the bottom there. Um, and she's the pig at the front, in front. So you can see there's a huge difference from what she looks like before to what she looks no like now. Um, and this is only four months after I left. So it's a, a huge improvement. And you might even say she's a little bit on the chunky side now, but that makes me very happy. So the final group that I focused on with the pigs was Delisay's group um, and for some reason this group just did not want to eat anything that I introduced um, to them at all. Um, they didn't want to eat their pellet, they didn't want to eat their mash, they barely ate anything at all um, and they were just constantly losing weight the whole time I was there. I tried everything with them, peanut, um, sunflower seeds, bird mix, everything um, and they just didn't touch it. Uh, anything that was new they didn't really recognise as food which was very frustrating. Um, the only things they did eat were mealworms, coconuts and bananas. So I gave them as much of that as possible. And luckily, um, you can see on the left hand side of this screen here is this mealworm breeding. So Lou Jean had a small stash of mealworms that he had in the office um, and he fed them to the long-tailed macaques there. Um, and I asked him where he got them from and he said that 10 years ago someone had given him a small amount and since then he'd been breeding them. Um, so the picture in the top left there is 
I mean, I don't know anything about bugs, but this is what he told me. He takes one of the mealworms out, he puts them in these tubes and they then turn into breeding mealworms. So by doing this, he's been able to keep that stash going for 10 years, which is pretty incredible. And so I brought him loads of new containers, loads of new um, pipes and tubs um, so that he can continue to breed them, but do it on a bigger scale. And um, so that we can then give pigs to all, um, we can then give bugs to all the pigs, um, especially the thin ones. Um, so that was really good that he was doing that. Um, so with this group, I wormed them, I wormed them, um, I increased their diet and they still, uh, most of them put on weight, but Delicy, who's the breeding female in the group, just didn't put on weight. Um, and while I was there, I tried to get in contact with lots of vets and it wasn't really, um, there weren't really any vets that, that knew much about these pigs. Um, but luckily, because I'd been to Tallarack Foundation, um, I'd spent a lot of time with the vet over there and she was really lovely and I spoke about Centrop um, and she was really keen to be involved and to kind of be their vet consultant. So I managed to set it up so that whenever they had any issues, they spoke to her um, and if she wasn't able to get there um, because the sites are about eight to 10 hours apart, like it's a long way for her to travel. If she needs to do any kind of work, she could at least advise them. Um, so after I left, Delice continued to lose weight um, and did look very, very, very So This picture in the top left, you can see um, you can see her spine, you can see her hips. Um, she's a very, very thin, very thick pig there. Um, so I advised that they kind of spoke to the vet and the vet came and did uh, anaesthetic on her. She took some blood and they found out that actually she had a parasite. Um, so if I wasn't in contact with the vet, if that hadn't have happened, she would have definitely died, this pig. Um, so he managed to treat her and you can see in the bottom there, she's looking rather quite healthy, which is really nice. Um, so she's put on tons of weight. Obviously, she's still a little bit bald there, but it always tends to be the hair that grows back last and, and they don't really look that healthy until it does. But, and yeah, I really, when I was there, I really, really did think she wasn't going to make it. So I was really happy that we were able to save her. It's a really nice story. Um, so on to the deer now. Um, I pretty much did everything that I did with a pig diet, with a deer diet, as I've already said. Um, but the deer kind of still didn't look in very good condition. They put on a little bit of weight, but they just weren't looking very good, not as good as the pigs were. And um, so while I was over there, I kind of watched the deer a lot. Um, and the enclosures were just a bit too overcrowded. So there were a lot of deer in a very small enclosure. So the enclosures were actually quite big. There's just too many of them in there. Um, and they were fed in these tires. So these same tires that you can see the pig eating from here. The deer were fed in there so it works with the pigs because there weren't very many of them but with the deer there were so many and there were kind of one to two tires in maybe a group of 10 deer so the deer that were more dominant would get all the food and the deer that weren't very dominant wouldn't get any food um, and that's kind of how it went so um, I'm not a big fan of bowls but I had to introduce bowls to the um, instead of we got rid of the tires and we introduced these silver bowls which you can see in the top left there um, and the idea behind that was that each deer had their individual bowl. And if there was tension in the group, we had more bowls and we spread them out as far as possible. So every deer had a chance to kind of get some food and it tended to work quite well. And um, I'd rather have introduced troughs, but I just couldn't source them anyway. I couldn't find them at all. Um, but these bowls actually, after I did buy them, I realized that Tarot Foundation were also using these kind of bowls. So that was kind of all that was available over there. And it really did help. Um, and it helped with the tension in the group as well. Um, I also introduced furniture, um, which is what it's called. It's kind of the stuff that's in that middle, top middle slide there. And it's just stuff to distract the animals, stuff they can hide behind. So they don't always have to have visual access to deer that can be quite intimidating. Um, the sides of the enclosure as well were made from mesh and every deer enclosure backed onto another deer enclosure. So they could always see other deer in other enclosures, which can be quite stressful. Um, so ideally what I want to do is put bamboo kind of cladding as a visual barrier all the way around the enclosures. I didn't get around to doing that while I was there and I also ran out of money, um, but that is something that I would like to do. Um, instead of it, we kind of put fine mesh around the bottom of the enclosure. Um, the deer used to stand up on the side and a couple of times the deers who slipped through and caused injuries. So we kind of meshed that over so that couldn't happen again. Um, <clears throat> But yes, I do want to introduce that bamboo cladding as soon as I can. 
Um, another thing that I did was introduce pools to the deers. So um, you can see in this bottom left hand corner, this is kind of what happened a lot when I was there. Um, whenever it rained, the deer would spend all of their time in these big muddy puddles um, and then they'd just be covered in mud and they'd have no way to clean themselves. Um, they did have pools in their enclosure, but they obviously hadn't been used for a very long time. Um, and I spoke to the deer keeper and he kind of said, oh, they don't really like the pool, so we don't really use them. Um, but me being me, I cleaned them anyway and I filled them anyway. Um, and you can see by this top left picture that deers absolutely love them. Literally, as soon as I cleaned them and filled them, the deer were all in there. And that was really lovely to see. Um, I also brought loads of cement and um, for the deer enclosures that didn't have pools in, I asked um, the head keeper, Eugene, if he would make some pools for me. Um, which he didn't have time to do when I was there, but he has continued to do the work um, since I left. And this bottom um, left-hand corner one are the pools that he's made for me since leaving, um, which is really nice. So after making all these changes to the deers, um, like I said, when we changed the diet, they did put on weight, but they just didn't look very nice. You can kind of see the difference between the two deer here. So before um, he was thin, but his coat just didn't look very nice. There's, a bit ragged and then afterwards you can see um, quite how chunky he is there which is really nice and also his spots are more defined so this is Uriel here um, and the same with this group and um, these are just a few examples but pretty much all the animals did put on weight did look much nicer bigger fluffier um, and just much healthier happier animals which is really nice um, so apart from the deer and pigs, there were a couple of animals there which um, caught my attention because their enclosures were not great. Um, the long-term macaque enclosure was by far the worst enclosure there. Um, and although I went out there to help the deer and the pigs, I just couldn't ignore it. Um, so they, they had two long-term macaques, a male and a female, and they were ex-pets. Um, they'd been confiscated and someone had sent them to Central, um, but it was quite clear that they hadn't looked after primates before and they weren't really used to looking after primates. So this top left enclosure, just the front of that enclosure um, had two animals in it and they were living in separate sides of the enclosure. They don't get on at all. Um, so one side was a female, the other side was a male. So obviously they've got visual access to each other all the time. They can't avoid each other. Um, and it's generally just not very nice. Um, the keeper would clean it about once a week. In order to do that, he'd have to go in with a female, clean with her in there. And you then have to open the slide and allow the male to go in and he would basically chase the female out of one side and into the other side. He'd then shut the slide and he'd then clean in the side of the female in and he had to do this because he wasn't allowed to go in with a male. The male was really dangerous but he could go in with the female so he had to kind of put her under quite a lot of stress every time he cleaned that enclosure which is not very nice. Um, so he, yeah, he kind of cleaned that once a week and the water bowls the same, um, but the male had a tendency of kind of flipping over the water bowls. Um, so if he did that at the beginning of the week, then that water wouldn't necessarily be replenished for quite a while after that. Um, so this enclosure is where I spent the majority of the money that we raised. Um, I hope you can see all the improvements we made here, um, but we basically doubled the size of the enclosure so that back half of the enclosure looks like this bottom left hand picture um, and we just redid it all. Um, so I, the main um, hold up in Centrop is that in order to get any maintenance work done, it has to be approved by the university. And then after that, the maintenance department have to kind of schedule it into their work. But they also run the university as well, they do all the maintenance stuff in the university. So they're not really very free at all. Um, so it can take years for any kind of enclosure maintenance or adaptations to take place. Um, so we think we have it bad here, but we really don't. Um, so Lee Jean told me that two years ago, this enclosure was signed off to be redone for these animals, um, but they just hadn't seen the money, they hadn't had the funding, so he wasn't able to do anything with it. Um, so I said to him, put together a list of what you need. Um, and he did. And then we went out and bought it, which was really lovely. It's probably the richest I have felt in my entire life. Um, I've never been able to go and just buy everything I wanted, but um, thanks to the mammal team, I was able to do that. Um, we bought mesh, we bought pipes, and we bought all the tools we needed as well. So grinders, cutters, uh, we bought everything. Um, I bought everything that he wanted, and then I also bought everything that I thought that they might need. Um, so the zookeepers listening be very jealous of this. Um, I bought drills, I bought drill bits, 
doors, hammers, everything that I thought they might want. Um, and I bought two of them so that they had one at each site so they didn't have to share them. Um, I bought all the basics as well, so things like scrubbing brushes, squeegees, um, disinfectant, they had none of these things. Um, so I just bought it all, and that is where I spent the majority of my money. But I hope you can see the difference it's made here. Um, so we introduced, um, so then um, we made the enclosures, so it had four separate parts, so you could move the animals around um, using slides to each part of the enclosure without having to mix them. You could clean in one half, you could then let an animal through and you could then clean in the other half. So you never had to go in with an animal either. So it's much safer for the keeper. Um, we built enrichment into the enclosure. We left areas of the enclosure uncovered so that the animals were able to get to some UV, which wasn't possible before. Um, and yeah, Lou Jean, I mean, I say we, Lou Jean did all of this. He worked very, very hard and he did all of this himself. Um, it was really nice. Um, and after I left, actually, he continued to work on this enclosure and he continued to put lots of little different things in it. So it was really nice to see any, I knew he did this because he kept sending me the pictures, which was really nice. I also taught him about enrichment. So um, previous to this, they didn't really put anything in with their animals at all, which I wasn't surprised by because literally everything I introduced, the animals were terrified of. So I knew it was kind of the, the case. Uh, but here's a kind of example of all the things that he now does there on a regular basis. Um, so there's seed scatters there for the macaque. Um, there's movable branches, there's pipe feeders, um, there's troughs um, so that the deers uh, can eat up high which helps strengthen the neck muscles um, and there's a picture of, um, so that's the macaque that used to tip all the water bowls over so now Lee Jean's put a cement water bowl in there so you can't do it anymore so they've always got water and um, they've also got a pool in their other side of the enclosure which is really nice because they love splashing around in the water and it's really nice to see um, but my personal favourite is um, a chunky pig in a wallow in the bottom corner there. So um, before that, they, the pigs didn't have wallows at all. They didn't hose down the areas and they just kind of left the pigs to it. So if it wasn't raining, the pigs weren't able to have wallow areas. They made sure that they did that. Um, and it makes me very happy. Um, and again, Lou Jean does all this all the time now. And I know he does because he sends me lovely pictures. Uh, so another enclosure that we, one of the two enclosures that we changed were um, the Asian palm civet and the leopard cat. So the top picture here is the enclosure they were in. Um, they were in one of these each um, when I first got there. And they're not tiny, but obviously they're not ideal. And it's not really the kind of enclosure that I'm used to. Um, but there were also two identical enclosures there that were just empty. Nothing was in them at all. So um, all we did really is we made a slide between the two enclosures. We joined them together and we doubled the size of their enclosure really, really easy, really, really quickly. Um, and um, that picture in the bottom left is just some enrichment that Lujin's put in for the civet. But when I was there, I barely saw these animals. They were hardly out. And after we made the adaptations, they were out quite a lot all the time. And that was really nice to see as well. Um, you can just see he's put some enrichment things in the bottom there as well. So he's put some like leaf litter in there, um, a trough feeder, that kind of thing. Um, so that's really nice. Um, the fact that before they were just in one half of that enclosure um, meant that Lujin couldn't clean them at all. So he literally just used to throw food in and take the bowls out. And that's all he did with those animals. They weren't cleaned, they weren't enriched at all. Um, but just by adding that slide, he was able to shut the animals in one half, clean one half. Um, and then reversed it so actually they had daily enrichment, daily cleaning um, every single day, which was really nice. Um, so the final thing that I tackled when I was there was overcrowding. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there were a lot of animals. I think it was um, 80, 87 deer and 37 pigs, um, all in not very big enclosures. Um, and the reason they're breeding them is because they're critically endangered. But also with the same water pigs and Philippine spotted deer, if you stop breeding them within a year to two years, they can just become infertile. Um, so the recommendation that we have over in zoos over here is breeding cull. Um, so that was what Central was supposed to be doing, but instead of culling, they just bred and bred and bred and bred. And that's kind of why they're in the situation that they're in. Um, so when I was over, I had to make a really, really tough decision um, and I decided to separate the sexes, so I separated the male and female deer um, 
which is not ideal. It's not what I wanted to do, but I kind of thought the more they breed, the more full welfare those animals will be in. Um, and the idea of this was that we separate them, we can then build them some new enclosures, we can then try and move some animals on, and then we can then start to breed these animals more responsibly. Um, so when I was over at Tallarat Foundation, um, they had actually purchased a huge, huge bit of land, or were given a huge bit of land, I think, and they'd actually built the stock release site on there. Um, and they were planning, when I was there, they were planning on moving the pigs um, and the deer from, from their zoo to the site, and they were kind of discussing how to do this. Um, so the way that they do it is they have a big net and they put it across the middle of the enclosure and then they herd the animals in and then they wrap them up in the net and then put them in a crate. So it's not very nice and it's really stressful and it causes a lot of kind of injuries. Um, but that's kind of how they do it. So when I was there, I was able to talk to them and kind of devise a plan of how we could um, do this in a less stressful way. So I figured out that we could use their keeper areas and their keeper corridors and we could kind of herd the animals into these areas and then have a crate at the end and you could just filter them through. Um, and when I spoke to them, I kind of thought they're probably not going to do this because they were looking at me like that's really not going to work. Um, but eventually they did actually do that. So I had a message from the, um, the head of Tellerac Foundation not very long ago saying that they did use that idea and they were able to funnel the animals through and they transferred something like 30 animals from their zoo um, to the soft release site and those animals are there now and they're doing really well. So that was great, great to hear that. But because they've transferred those animals over, they now have room for more animals. Um, so, uh, the head of Tellerat Foundation has said that he's going to take 15 of these female deer from Centrop, which is huge. This is a great, great thing. Um, and he's going to take them and he's going to take them and release them in his soft release site. So it gives those animals an opportunity to mix with male deer and to breed. Um, and these animals, you know, this is one stage closer um, for them to be released into the wild. So it's, it's actually incredible, really. It's more than I could have hoped for. And hopefully one day we can do it with the pigs too. Um, so here's a slide of all the things that we that I've talked about that I improved while I was over there. Um, but there's, there's still a lot that needs to be done over there. Um, so as I was talking about with what we did at Tellerat Foundation with, with the crowds, I'd like to build that kind of thing into the enclosures at Centrop so we're able to kind of transfer the animals from Centrop to Tellerac, um easily and stress-free. Um, all of the shelters in the enclosure are a bit ropey looking. Um, so I want to rebuild those. Um, I need to get a, a vet on site really because although Monica's great, their Tellerac vet, it's a long way for her to come if there is an emergency. Um, and of course, add the bamboo cladding in between the deer enclosures. So these are kind of my ideas that I'd like to implement over the next years, um, over the next year. And so hopefully I will be able to do that. Um, but that's it really. Um, thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, as Mark said earlier, that um, these are in quite a dire state at the moment. So there's just a link there. Um, if you do want to donate to Bristol Zoo, um, it'd be much, much appreciated if you are able to. And um, there's also my um, email address at the bottom there. At the bottom there. Um, so if you have any questions about anything that I've spoken about, please do um, drop me an email. We'll reply. Um, but apart from that, thank you very much for listening. And sorry about um, all the terrible slide sharing. I'm not very good at technology. Shani, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. And don't worry about minor technical glitches. What matters is it was really excellent content. Um, it was really fantastic to see the linkages between um, obviously highly specialized knowledge about, about animal welfare um, and the linkages with the conservation of critically endangered species. Uh, and it's lovely to see the linkages between um, the Bristol Zoological Society in the UK and those two institutions in the Philippines. So thank you again. Um, now, I am going to start having a look for um, questions in the chat, if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. So if anyone would like to would like to post a question in the chat, please do so and I will pass those on to Shani. 
we've just got a couple of comments um, from Anne saying, thanks, Shani, that was really interesting. And from Jules saying, thank you, that was interesting. Didn't realise how much Bristol Zoo does. Oh, that's nice to hear. <laughs> we try our best. And if the audience don't have questions, then I'm going to start grilling you with questions. So don't worry, you're not getting away that easily. I realise, however, that it is seven o'clock. So maybe if we if we have five minutes of time for questions, if that's OK. Yeah, no problem. I didn't realise I'd rambled on for that long. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to I'm going to ask the hard hitting questions. So you made lots of really fantastic changes. Oh, no, here we go. The questions are all coming in. Ignore me. <laughs> um, so uh, Brian asks, first he says, he says, thanks, Shani, great presentation. When are you next planning to head out to the Philippines? Uh, well, the original plan was to head out around November again this year, which was the same as I went out last year. But I just don't think it's going to be possible. Um, coronavirus has obviously hindered pretty much everything. Um, and logistically there's too much work to be done at Bristol Zoo for me to be able to leave um, anytime soon but um, hopefully I'll be able to get over there within the next year. I do want to, I, I have been in contact with everyone so everything that I've put in place is still in place which is really lovely to hear but I just want to improve it further and kind of follow up on all the things that I really really want to do out there and um, so hopefully um, fingers crossed um, mid-time next year really if coronavirus doesn't stop that. Thank you, Shani. And uh, a question linked to that from Anne, who asked, do you think that you'll be able to raise the funds for the outstanding work, for all the things that you didn't manage to get round to this time? I really hope so. Um, and I think I would probably have the whole mammal team behind me at Bristol Zoo again. Um, and in a very short period of time, we were able to raise a, a, a large amount of money. So I think we could definitely do it again. I think it would take a bit longer. Um, but I think I've got a really great team of keepers there and we're all very passionate about this project and about the Visay Morty Pigs um, and it, it's a chance for us to kind of raise and do some, some real conservation work out there so I, I think we can, I believe the team can do it um, and hope that we'll get the opportunity to do it soon. Um, again it's all been hindered by coronavirus at this point, I did hope that we'd be able to raise, uh, have at least started raising the money by now but it's just and um, people just aren't in that position currently but fingers crossed soon we can start raising the money. Thanks Shani. So I have another question from Jessica who asks are these centres open to the public in the Philippines and did you see any education slash interactive signage slash interpretation to assist these pigs in the wild? Um, so at Centrop no um, sorry, they, it is open to the public, but there isn't any kind of educational intro or anything like that there. Um, a lot of that kind of stuff is done through the university, but when you actually go around the, um, the zoo, you don't see anything like that there. Um, Tallarack Foundation, yes, there's lots of signage. Um, if you go around the zoo there, it's quite similar to zoos here, so they do have all of that kind of stuff in place, so they do realise how important those animals are, but um, unfortunately it's central that that wasn't a thing but um that is something i can put forth to them it's a pretty good idea thanks shani um <laughs> Anne wishes to add don't forget there's a whole team of volunteers who could help with fundraising oh thank you Anne. i will take you up on that offer um and i think maybe as it's as it's six minutes past seven i'll, I'll ask you one more question uh from claire who asks um have you found there is a lack of interest in conserving warty pigs as a result of their domestic counterparts or do you think it's more the lack of knowledge of them and this is coming from someone who says watching my uh, with my dad who's a pig farmer um i do think there is a lack of interest i just think it's just not really out there very much i think there's all the big kind of species like the gorillas and the orangutans that uh maybe more charismatic if you don't and I've never worked with them before. Um, but I think, you know, as soon as I kind of put this out there, I was able to raise the, we were able to raise the money um, relatively easily. I just think that um, not many people know about it. 
And actually, realistically, with these animals, there's a real chance that they can be released back into the world. So I think that's a real selling point there that these um, we can actually do that. So if you donate towards this, that might actually happen. Um, but I don't, I don't think there's lack of interest. I just think it, it it's just not maybe publicised as well. Shani, um, thank you very much again for a wonderful talk. And, thank, and it's really fantastic to, to hear your expertise and how that got used out in the Philippines. Um, so that's the end of this lecture. Um, so for everybody who is looking forward to future conservation lectures, I will say that um, I am organizing another series of online conservation lectures. Unfortunately, I can't yet publicize the timeline and the talk titles for those. I'm currently working with my colleagues now to get that together for you. But as soon as I'm able to, I'll put out some more information about the upcoming talks that we're going to have. Um, so if you would like, you can join our mailing list by sending me an email. My name's Mark Abrahams, so it's mabrahams at bristolzoo.org.uk. Um, and other than that, thank you all very much for joining us this evening and have a lovely few weeks until we hopefully uh, see you again.